Good evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Uh, I'm Eva Paus, director of the McCulloch Center for Global Initiatives and professor of economics here at Mount Hoya College. Uh, before introducing tonight's speaker, I would, I have to thank a few people. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Carol Hoffman Collins, Mount Holyoke class of 63, whose generosity has made the Global Scholar in Residence program possible. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the McCulloch Center, especially Jenny Medina, the members of the Student Advisory Board, uh, <laughs> the members of the Faculty Advisory Board and uh, particularly the faculty members who invited Dr. Speranskaya into her classes this week. As you know, the McCulloch Center works with faculty, students, staff across campus to promote global education on campus. And as part of our efforts, we host a Global Scholar in Residence every fall focusing on a particular global issue, and we embed her or him for a week in the intellectual life of the college. The focus of the Global Scholar this year, this fall, this week, is the threat of chemical toxins to the environment and human health and safety around the world. Chemical toxins are poisons without passports somebody said, very fitting. They affect all of us around the world. And the key question is how can we reduce their impact and eventually eliminate them? And there is nobody better to engage those questions with us than tonight's speaker, an internationally renowned, recognized expert, scholar, leader, practitioner in this particular area, Dr. Olga. Speranskaya. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Speranskaya, but only a little bit because I really want her to give tonight's talk. Dr. Speranskaya is the co-chair, has been the co-chair of IPEN for four years. How many of you know what IPEN stands for? Well, at the end of the talk, more of you will know what IPEN stands for. IPEN is the International POPs Elimination Network. And how many of you know what POPs stands for in this particular context? Oh, thank you, Tim. Some of you, the persistent organic pollutants like DDT or PCBs or dioxins. Olga Speransky is one of the co-founders of IPEN in the late 1990s, and when they started, they started with 50 people. Today, it is an international network of more than 700 NGOs in 116 countries, and the goal of IPEN is to eliminate toxins from the environment. Olga Speranskaya holds a PhD in environmental physics from the Academy of Russian Sciences, and when she got her degree in the early 90s, it coincided with a period of the implosion of the Soviet Union. And that means a period where people became increasingly aware of the incredible number of stockpiles of highly toxic, obsolete pesticides all over the former Soviet republics. And that's when Olga Speranskaya became not only a physicist, but a physicist activist, as she formed a civil society network that has grown to include NGOs, government organizations, and academia in 11 former Soviet republics. And the goal, again, of this network involving thousands of people has been to reduce the legacy, the toxic legacy of pesticides and chemicals in the so former Soviet Union and to pressure and lobby the governments to sign and ratify the Stockholm Convention. In 2004, in the Stockholm Convention, countries commit themselves to stop the release of POPs, P 
persistent organic pollutants into the environment. Olga Spernskaya also is the director of the chemical safety program at the Eco Accord Center for the Environment and Sustainable Development in Russia. It is the regional hub of IPEN. And she also has been the recipient of the most prestigious prizes worldwide in recognition of environmental efforts, in recognition really of her relentless and successful efforts on behalf of the reduction of chemical toxins. In 2011, she was the recipient of UNEP's Champion of the Earth Award, and in 2009, she received the Goldman Environmental Prize, the two most prestigious prizes in the world to recognize her work and activism in this area. It is my, it's a great honor to have her on campus this week and to have her speak to us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Olga Speranskaya. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Paz, for this introduction. Actually, you make my life here much easier because you, you just um, talked a lot about me. So thank you very much. And um, well, uh, and thank you for coming here. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here in Mount, Mount Elliot uh, College. This is my first time here, and I'm so excited. It's a great place to be. And I actually attended a workshop yesterday and today, and students were just amazing with lots of questions, so I'm really impressed. So thank you so much. Um, actually, um, Professor Pauz has already introduced uh, the uh, International Pops Elimination Network, Persistent Organic Pollutants Elimination Network, a huge uh, network of non-governmental organizations I work with. But I just would like to, um, oops. Yeah. I just would like you to, uh, to have firm some um, uh, better understanding, uh, understanding of how we work. Yes, we were established in 1998, and the reason uh, the network was established is because uh, we want non-governmental organizations to be more involved into the negotiation process over the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. Actually, this is a unique convention because it is aimed at global ban of certain extremely hazardous chemicals. Mm, just, oh, okay. So it's, <laughs> it's a global ban convention, which is really exciting and great. Uh, uh, IPAN works at different levels. We work at the international level, and uh, we actually, we do our best to uh, present uh, the concerns and problems uh, from the uh, from the national level, from the community level, to the uh, governmental participants attending uh, high-level uh, international meetings on chemical safety, so that they better understand what is going on on the ground, because frankly speaking, not all of them really know the problems that their own people face at the community level. So we do our best to make them aware of people's needs. And also, we transfer the decisions which are made on the global level to the community, to the national level, so that people can use this, this decision in their fights, in their uh, discussion, communication with the governments, with the aim to push the governments forward, to uh, strengthen their legislation, to improve, um, to improve laws, to uh, just with the goal to finally eliminate certain toxic chemicals. And um, this is the geographical scope of IPAN work. So we work mainly with developing countries and countries with economies in transition. So you see we work uh, with Latin America, we work uh, in Africa, we work in Southeast Asia, and we work with countries um, uh, which uh, became independent after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, but also, uh, IPAM members are from the United States, from Canada, from Japan. So this is a really um, global, global network. Okay, so uh, we are focused mainly on uh, chemicals which uh, disrupt hormone functions, which cause cancers or birth defects and harm reproduction, which are extremely toxic because they stay in the environment 
for ages, and they, uh, they contaminate humans and wildlife and actually cause irreversible damage to people's health. And so uh, we are focused on different exposure sources. We work with industrial pollution, we work on waste stockpiles, we work on exposure at the workplace, at home, and in uh, agricultural areas. So we address different pollution sources. And th these are just um, examples of IPAN global campaigns. So we, we played the leading role in initiating campaigns on for example, mercury-free products, or um, no toxic chemicals in consumer products. We work on highly hazardous pesticides. We work on um, electronic waste, and much more. But this is just to give you a brief understanding what, what is going on within the network. But I'm focused on chemicals, because I'm sure that uh, global chemical contamination is the greatest threat we are facing now. Actually, chemical, chemical contamination jeopardizes our future and the health of the coming generations and their ability to address comprehensive problems of the modern world. And this problem is largely underestimated and actually ignored by politicians and governments worldwide. And even though countries have environmental laws and they have environmental and health ministries and also um, they have regulations which are supposed to control pollution, but the pollution is rising and not falling, largely because of political and economic power of industrial lobbies and their close partnership with governments, their ignorance of people's health, people's concerns, and actually people's life. And while these governments and industries rule countries, toxic contamination continues killing softly and silently every day. So food we eat, consumer products we use, personal care products we use, electronic devices, and even products for children which are intended to bring joy to the families, in fact, could bring diseases with long-term negative consequences. And just to, um, even though Ivor told me to cut down the examples, I, I can't um, just, I, I want to share some with you. Um, you probably know the latest tragedy in eastern, um, eastern uh, part of India, in Bihar, when 23 kids were poisoned by food containing monocrotophores, a highly hazardous pesticide, and these kids actually died is just one tragic example of the war we are facing now. The case is that uh, World Health Organization uh, declared monocrotophores as a highly hazardous pesticide. But unfortunately, a group of national scientific experts persuaded by producers and manufacturers of this uh, uh, hazardous uh, chemical uh, who said that this is a very effective pesticide and much cheaper than available alternative. So the production and the use of this highly toxic pesticide will continue. So, uh, and uh, just a few months ago, there was a conference of parties to the Rotterdam Convention on prior informed consent on um, agricultural chemicals and industrial chemicals in international trade. And uh, the decision to list paraquat, also a highly hazardous pesticide, under this convention was blocked by Guatemala and India. And a person whom everybody thought was a representative of the Guatemala official governmental delegation happened to be an industrial observer who deceived the entire meeting unless his uh, true status was revealed and he was removed from the meeting. But what he did, he did that. So the decision to list Barquat under the Rotterdam Convention was, uh, was actually um, uh, was blocked. Well, in 2001, um, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights stated that living in a pollution-free world is a basic human right and that the fundamental right to life is threatened by exposure to toxic chemicals, hazardous wastes, and contaminated drinking water and food. We can provide examples to justify this statement, but if you ask people in the streets, 
what is the major environmental threat we are facing now? The majority will say it's climate change. Information about climate change is all over the world. And governments easily um, share information about the number of people killed by a tsunami or, uh, or a hurricane or an earthquake. Uh, or an earthquake, um, and actually governments cannot be directly blamed for these uh, losses, right? Um, and also uh, there was um, uh, quite recently um, um, a, a new report, Climate Vulnerability Monitor was released, and it is stated that economic impact of global warming uh, costs countries $1.2 trillion a year, right? But do you know that, oops, um, uh, do you know that childhood lead exposure alone costs um, uh, developing countries more than $977 billion annually? And this is just one chemical, just one chemical. And uh, the model to evaluate this cost does not consider um, just all possible, uh, all possible costs and only cover just part of the whole picture, right? So lead is so toxic that there are no safe uh, limits of exposure. Uh, probably you know um, Philippe Grandjean, uh, he's a professor, environmental scientist, and he states that lead um, contributed to the collapse of Roman Empire and uh, um, samurai regime in Japan. But today, our brains are facing much more serious challenge because uh, our brains are exposed to a number of toxic chemicals. It's lead, mercury, arsenic, highly hazardous pesticides, persistent industrial chemicals. And uh, this exposure actually makes us less able to plan for the future and to just prevent, to prevent even more um, dangerous uh, pollution. So, but it is good to know that uh, some researchers start, um, start um, turning their attention to the link between generally accepted environmental threat, which is climate change, and the new threat we are talking about, which is uh, chemical contamination. And uh, the report, which is uh, I have just mentioned, climate change, uh, uh, climate vulnerability monitor, it was. Um, it was prepared by 50 scientists. They were environmental scientists, economists, and policy experts, and commissioned by 20 governments. And um, these researchers, they um, predict that by 2030, the, um, uh, the cost of climate change and air pollution combined, combined, yes, will rise to 3.2% of the global GDP. And uh, less developing countries will suffer 11% loss of their GDP. And um, two years ago, uh, United Nations Environmental Program and Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program released a groundbreaking report. It was called Climate Change and Persistent Organic Pollutants, Predicting the Impact. And in this report, um, Research state that climate change affects release, distribution, degradation, and exposure to persistent organic pollutants. They also predict that uh, the demand in, um, in some uh, the demand of some persistent organic pollutants, such as DDT, will increase because of the changing patterns of uh, disease vector. Uh, I mean, of uh, diseases such as malaria. And unfortunately, this prediction came true just in two years because the mortality rate due to malaria is rising in Africa. And African states adopted a formal decision, and it was two months ago, to officially start using DDT to control malaria. And actually, IPAN raised strong concerns over that because uh, the more DDT is produced or used in Africa, it will pollute African environment and African people, but it will also pollute environment in the far distant area. For example, such areas as the Arctic, which is geographically just so far away. But DDT is persistent organic pollutant, and one of its char characteristics is that it can travel far away from the original pollution source. 
sell their water and, uh, and air currents, uh, take DDT all the way to the Arctic. And actually, in the Arctic, DDT and other persistent organic pollutants, they are stuck there. They, ac they are accumulated by the wildlife. They are stay within the environment. And they contaminate people a lot. And they do not go anywhere. They just stay in the Arctic. And mm, I can... Um, project in the Arctic, when we um, invest, uh, w w we had a study when we uh, just estimated the levels of certain uh, persistent organic pollutants in the blood of the indigenous peoples. And we found very high levels of persistent organic pollutants in, in, in the blood of these people. And we also found uh, health problems, severe health problems that are directly linked to the level of uh, these toxic chemicals in the blood of these people. And these uh, health problems directly linked to the health problems that will future generation of indigenous people definitely have. So these and other information on toxic chemicals should be broadly available to people so that they, uh, the more you know, the, the better prepared you are, right? So that you can uh, just mitigate uh, exposure on your health, right? So non-governmental organizations do their best to make this and other information on chemical hazards public. But governments and industries, they have more information than we do because they have more money, they can have more research and generate more data, but they have much less willingness to share this information. And actually, uh, less people know um, well, um, well, the more quiet they are, right? So if people are quiet, it means that um, you can continue your dirty things. You can pr continue production of toxic chemicals. You, can, uh, you, can, uh, you do not need to renovate uh, industrial processes. You do not need to invest more into uh, just new technologies. You can just stay as you are. And this is um, actually a very serious problem. Uh, but governments, governments themselves, um, they contribute a lot to this, uh, to, uh, to this uh, problem, and especially in developing countries and countries with economies in transition, because uh, there is no enough money, as people say, as, as governments say, but also very low uh, just political will to, to make a real change. So you may say, am I safe from toxic chemicals? But I can say, no. But nobody can be safe from toxic chemicals. Regarding of, uh, your income or position in the society. Just um, a few years ago, a Canadian uh, organization, Environmental Defense Canada, they um, produced a report, Toxic Nations, a report on, uh, on pollution in Canadians. And uh, they made uh, a conclusion that the health of the environment goes hand in hand with people's health. So where all these chemicals actually come from? Of course, it is uh, contaminated soil and food we eat. Right? So uh, IPAN report that was produced a couple of years ago, also in 2000, 2005, we investigated the levels of toxic chemicals in eggs, because eggs are just common food products. Yes? And uh, 17 countries were involved, and tw we, uh, we tested eggs from 20 places. And you can see the levels of persistent organic pollutants in the samples that we tested. All uh, 20 sites revealed very high levels of uh, these toxic chemicals in eggs, in just ordinary food products. And 12 out of 17 countries involved in this project, they, they had this kind of research for the first time ever. So never before governments or anybody else initiated similar uh, projects uh, to analyze the levels of contamination of ordinary food uh, in um, of, uh, just levels of contamination of hazardous chemicals in ordinary uh, food products. But quite uh, just quite recently, uh, research has started focusing on new source of pollution. It's 
just consumer products and personal care products. Uh, last year, we had a groundbreaking project in the Philippines when we tested the level of mercury in skin lightening creams. You know that these kind of uh, creams are very popular in Southeast Asia, in China, in the Philippines. And we found extremely high levels of mercury in skin uh, lightening creams. And when we were releasing this information, in parallel, we found patients, women who were taken to hospitals because of kidney damage. Yes, and that was a result of, of, um, of uh, using these uh, skin lightening creams because mercury it just penetrates through your, through your skin and affects other parts of your body. Yes. So that was an absolute shock for the Philippine society, but also for the government. Actually, it's a good practice example because uh, in this case, governments did not, government did not oppose the results, but it was so shocked that together with NGOs, they started thinking of how to strengthen their national legislation, yes, to avoid these cases and to minimize the level of mercury uh, in uh, skin lightening cream. But another example, another IPAN project on heavy metals, six heavy metals in children's products in China, in the Philippines, and in six countries of the former Soviet Union revealed extremely high levels of heavy metals such as mercury, lead, arsenic, antimony, cadmium, chromium in children's toys, in children's jewelry, in children's cosmetics. And there is no particular reason why these toxic chemicals are actually in children's products. Why producers still apply these uh, toxic chemicals, whether they are used the, uh, them in the production process. So there is no reason for that because there are alter uh, available alternatives. And there is no reason and no explanation why governments allow these products to enter their markets whether these products are produced locally, nationally, or imported from other countries. So it is obvious lack of control. Well, but uh, nevertheless, chemical industry is going to uh, develop just profitably uh, till uh, 2030. And ac according to WHO, industrial and agricultural chemicals and acute chemical poisonings are responsible for 1.2 million deaths per year, with developing countries suffering the most because dirty industries actually move to developing countries. So the production and use of toxic chemicals are increasing in developing countries because, as I said, they have weaker legislation, they have no control, and also they have quite high level of corruption. And uh, the last story is from Bangladesh. You probably know about this. Um, Bangladesh has environmental ministry, it has environmental legislation, and it even has environmental court that is specifically focused on um, environmental cases. But pollution in the country is rising, and uh, largely, uh, and uh, so um, textile and garment and uh, pharmaceutical and tannery companies contribute and uh, contribute to this pollution a lot. And uh, actually, Bangladesh um, is uh, the world's number second uh, clothing uh, exporter after China. So you can find uh, products made in Bangladesh all over the world. And such giants as H&M, uh, Walmart, and Sears, they love uh, Bangladesh. Why? Because it has the lowest wages in the world. Yes? And also, um, there is a possibility to avoid uh, costly environmental legislation and pay minimum or nothing on occupational health. And. Um, Actually, uh, actually, this is um, uh, this is extremely uh, ex extremely serious so far. Yes, uh, but um, so th this ongoing pollution is complemented by the toxic legacy from the past. Uh, developing countries and countries with economies in transition, in addition to these dirty industries which are developing in, in uh, just in, in these countries, they have to face toxic legacy. I mean 
toxic that accumulated as a result of the previous activities. And this is an extreme situation when, for example, dilapidated storage, uh, obsolete pesticide storage facilities are all over developing countries and countries with economies in transition. And these toxic chemicals, they leak into the environment. They pollute everything. They pollute water and soil and contaminate people. Yes, and unfortunately, uh, these countries really do not have enough financial resources to tackle this problem. And there is very, uh, just, there is not, not enough uh, te uh, technologies to, to deal with it. Uh, but uh, what I would like, I would like to give you an example of uh, uh, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, for, uh, for those of you who do know the geography, it's in Central Asia, and it's one of the former Soviet country, uh, uh, Soviet republics, yes? So uh, Kazakhstan accumulated 250,000 tons of industrial wastes containing persistent organic pollutants. Now Kazakhstan wants to clean up, yes? So there is an option to transfer part of this waste to France for incineration. But Kazakhstan neighboring countries do not allow the country to transfer hazardous waste through their territories. So Kazakhstan um, thinks about airing. It, it decided to air part of this waste to France, which is extremely costly and not safe. Another option is to build a hazardous waste incinerator in Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan has already received uh, the, loan and, uh, yeah, the loan from the World Bank to start building the hazardous waste incinerator. And in the country which lack proper environmental control, proper health and, uh, and environmental monitoring system, uh, the country does not have um, environmental emission standards for toxic chemicals emission uh, from hazardous waste incinerator. The idea to build an incinerator is not uh, the best one. But the tricky thing is that the idea, this idea to build a hazardous waste incinerator is part of Kazakhstan green economy strategy. You know that green economy was introduced by UNEP uh, last year at the um, Rio Plus 20 Summit in Brazil. And if we are talking about um, green economy and um, uh, green economy and uh, chemicals, we are talking mainly about no data, no market, green uh, governmental procurement policy. We are talking about uh, market safety, no hazardous chemicals in consumer products, and we are talking about green jobs. But in many countries, uh, green economy means nothing but business as usual. Because many activities which are promoted as being green are actually not. And I will give you just an example of uh, artisan small scale gold mining. Do you know that, uh, first of all, some politicians really promote ASGM, artisan small-scale gold mining, as a green uh, economy, as a possibility to develop green jobs. So uh, I'm sure you know that one, uh, that yes, 25% of the world's gold on the market comes from artisan small-scale gold mining. But do you know that 80% of mercury contamination also comes from artisan small-scale gold mining. And UNEP characterized artisan small-scale gold mining as the number one mercury pollution source. But the problem is that in many developing countries, they have no any other option. 80% young people in Congo have to work in artisan small-scale gold mining either be because they have no any other possibilities, no any other capacity, but also they are forced to do this uh, by the police. And um, just a friend of mine, uh, she works on artisan small-scale gold mining in Indonesia. So she went to one of the villages uh, in the area, the village that is uh, involved in artisan small-scale gold mining to conduct uh, a research on the levels of mercury in people. She spent just a few days there, just a few days. But when she came back, she felt clear signs of mercury poisoning 
She felt dizzy. She felt problems with the memory. She felt unstable. So it was clear mercury poisoning. She spent just a few days. Can you imagine the health status of people who live there on a permanent base, who give birth to kids there? Who actually, this is their life. They, they come there, they give birth there, they die there. Nobody cares. There is no any health monitoring of people in ASGM. And the Mercury Convention, that will be signed just in a few days in Japan, a new Mercury Convention. It allows mercury trade for artisan scale gold mining. So to one uh, extent, mercury is the, um, ASGM is the first mercury pollution source. To the other hand, governments allow mercury trade for ASGM. One more example, and the last one, <laughs> uh, it's um, on e-waste. E-waste recycling is also considered a possibility for a green job for countries. But do you know that the majority of uh, developing countries, uh, majority of people who are involved in e-waste in developing countries, they simply use open burning as the process. And when you open burn um, e-waste, lots of toxic chemicals just come into the air. Immediately they contaminate the surroundings and uh, people's health are impacted. So definitely it is not a green job. China is the world's number one uh, dumping site of e-waste from developed countries. And the, China is already suffering from enormous pollution and cancer rate uh, has been, uh, yes, is, uh, has been, uh, I think it's 80% uh, uh, cancer uh, increase in cancer rates uh, during the last 30 years. And people complain for living in cancer villages. And 70% of the country's rivers are contaminated and half of them are unsuitable for people's intake. So, in Russia the pollution is not as severe as it is in China, but we need 80 years to clean up uh, air emission in these cities and 40,000 people die annually because of the air emission in the cities. Okay, so these are sad examples, yes? Uh, but uh, I'm just wondering whether you know Paul Conant. Paul Conant is a very well-known anti-insinuation activist. So uh, he said in his, um, in his speech uh, just this year in Brazil, he said that um, we need four planets if we consume like Americans. And we need four, uh, two planets if we consume like Europeans. So something needs to be changed. And with good political leadership, we can all be part of sustainability. But actually, uh, non-governmental organizations are part of this political leadership and actually driving force uh, of positive changes. I came here from Japan, uh, where IPAN uh, held its international heavy metal skill share. And you would have been just impressed with the number of uh, positive examples given by people from Thailand, the Philippines, uh, Sri Lanka, Czech Republic. So how many positive changes did people uh, achieved? Um, uh, um, changes uh, just on the governmental level, on just legislation, improvement of um, national regulations on toxic chemicals, which is really amazing. And this is the result of people's dedication and commitment to the work on toxic free future. But of course, um, non governmental organizations face very serious uh, pressure from the side of the governments and industrial lobbies. And sometimes this pressure uh, becomes really inappropriate when um, non-governmental organizations are physically uh, bitten right, uh, by the guards of um, industrial facilities, for example. And um, you probably know that uh, there are plans to develop copper and nickel mine in one of the most agriculturally um, rich area in Russia. Uh, the uh, information about this mine has been known for decades, and the Soviet government actually banned any um, explore, exploration of this mine because uh, it is situated in the most agriculturally um, um, just profitable area. But new government decided to start mining. 
It means that if, if they really succeed, it will kill this agricultural area. There will be no po more possibility to continue agriculture there. And uh, people uh, stand for it, and they physically, they physically uh, fight for their life there. And they are beaten, and they are put into hospitals, so there is a big fight going uh, in Russia over this issue. And uh, also, uh, another example of mercury uh, contamination. Uh, IPAN uh, project in, um, also in Russia on the board of the Volga River, we found out uh, very high levels of mercury in fish and in hair of the local residents. And the reason for that is uh, that there is a chloralkali facility operational in this area, which discharges mercury-containing water in, into the lake and into the river. And when we made this information public, so the, uh, the owners of this industrial facility, instead of um, starting discussion and dialogue with the civil society groups, they just behaved in a, an opposite way. They started a real war again against advocacy groups. Mm, they accused, uh, accused us in being international agents, in providing wrong data, in not being able to explain the data. So uh, they, they even established a non-governmental organization of their own, which stands, mm, stands forward and say, uh, no, this is a great facility, and they do so much. They give us jobs, so they, they, they can continue as they are. So a ridiculous situation, actually. Yes, but uh, nevertheless, so people do not stop fighting. And more uh, organizations join IPAN uh, and uh, join our branches at, uh, just in different parts of the world because they understand our mission, and they want to be part of this leadership and they want to be part of the global movement on toxic chemical, on just toxic free world. Okay, thank you.